uh, for millennia. I think the first recorded observation of a, of a supernova was somewhere around the year 200 AD. Uh, of course, now we have powerful telescopes. We've gotten a lot better at finding them. And so we've developed some taxonomy to classify the supernovas that we see. And so this is based on what's called the light curve, which is the profile of how bright a supernova is over time. So we have some that sort of are really bright and stay kind of bright for a while and fall off, some that seem to come and go. And in addition to these light curves, just the overall light production, by looking at the light that we see in more detail, we can actually try to measure the chemical composition at that supernova. So we can look for, for example, if there's hydrogen present, that will tend to absorb certain wavelengths of light. And so we can look at the spectrum of light that we observe from the supernova and see if it's missing some wavelengths from absorption by all these different elements. So by looking at the light, we can actually tell a lot about these. Uh, we can tell the you know, light curve, how long it lasts, as well as measuring something about the chemical composition, at least at the outside surface of the supernova. So as far as naming goes, we start out as a supernova. And then based on whether or not we think there's a, a lot or a little hydrogen present, we classify it as a type 1 or type 2. And then beyond that, there's a whole bunch of subcategories that depend on both the chemical composition and the shape of that light curve. So for example, over in the type 2 category, you can have a faint one, you can have a plateau, or it stays flat for a little while. There's even this funny uh, catch-all category, like the peculiar light curve, uh, some catch-all the oddballs. But these are all based on the light that we see, which, like I was saying last week, for the sun, the light really only tells us about what's happening on the outer surface. It doesn't really reveal anything about the dynamics driving the explosion inside. So I like to recategorize these according to, to that, to the dynamics. So put them in two different categories, thermonuclear and core collapse, where most of them are core collapse. So the thermonuclear type um, are essentially, this is type 1A. Um, you have some star, which is accreting matter, some more nuclear fuel from another nearby star, until it reaches some critical mass which triggers a runaway nuclear fusion process and the thing explodes. And so these are really interesting to astronomers because the conditions under which that happens involves this threshold mass. So anywhere in the universe you have this process, you hit that threshold mass and the thing explodes. So they're very repeatable. The type 1a supernovas are pretty similar from one to another and so we know about how bright they should be. So if you have one that happens more nearby and more far away, and you know how bright it should be, you can use the apparent brightness on Earth to tell how far away it is. So it gives us sort of a yardstick to measure distances in the universe. Uh, so that's great fun for astronomers. They like the core collapse kind too, but these are also fun for the neutrino people. Uh, so in this case, um, and we'll go into more detail, the core of this star actually collapses on itself, and that process produces these tons and tons of neutrinos. So these are the ones that that make the oodles of neutrinos. So we'll focus in on those. So again, these, these core collapse supernovas, extremely powerful explosion, a billion, billion, billion uh, nuclear bombs. Here's another example of the before and after, uh, this hapless star uh, exploding in this dramatic supernova explosion outshining the entire neighborhood around it. And so you might think, based on how bright this thing is, that a lot of that energy of those billion, billion, billion nuclear bombs is going into producing the photons that we see, uh, since it's so very bright. But in fact, our understanding of how the supernovas lose energy is that all that light that we see, it's only 0.01% of the energy that actually goes into electromagnetic radiation that produces light. So that's just a tiny fraction of the energy. The sliver is too small to see. <coughs> the next 1% goes into the ejecta, the stuff that just goes flying out into space uh, from this explosion. So the kinetic energy of that accounts for 1%. Of the so the missing 98.99% of the energy all goes into neutrinos. It's a staggering number, it's 10 to the 58 neutrinos. <coughs> so it's a lot. So if you thought that was really bright in photons, there it is. 
indescribably right in terms of neutrino data. Now, to, <coughs> to understand neutrino production in these events, uh, we will make a mathematical model of the depth of the giant star, uh, like we did for our sun last week. So this, uh, my giant star compared to our sun, uh, this is something like 50 times the size of our sun, that kind of scale. And the, the life cycle of this star is that it will start out as a big ball of hydrogen and undergo hydrogen fusion to create helium. Then the star will condense, contract, heat up, start fusing helium. Again, condense under the force of gravity, heat up, start fusing heavier, <coughs> heavier elements. And so you get this sort of onion layer of, of increasingly heavy elements until you reach this core of iron in the center. And once you reach the core of iron in the center, our giant star is in trouble. And the reason for that is that among all the atomic nuclei, iron is among the most tightly bound. So you can't produce energy through nuclear fusion of iron. And so once you, once you get to that point, the core of the star can no longer produce energy through nuclear fusion. And the whole structure of the star is a balance of gravity trying to crush the thing and then internal pressure pushing against that. That's what gives the star this ball of fire in space its shape. And so now you know, that's, there's thermal pressure that's coming from the nuclear fusion reactions, all the heat that's generated by that, which is holding this thing up against the force of gravity, which is then stalled in this iron core. And so once this thing reaches a mass of about one solar mass, the mass of our sun, or a little bit heavier, this thing is in really big trouble. And the reason for that, this, this threshold mass for that core, is what's called the Chandrasekhar limit. So this is named after Chandrasekhar, Nobel laureate, and uh, UChicago faculty for uh, quite a number of years. And uh, in, in true Chicago fashion, we are always uh, walking in the footsteps of, of geniuses. And, and this, this is uh, my office right there, right next door to Chandrasekhar's former office. And uh, in between there is a nice painting of Chandrasekhar at his desk. Um, so what Chandrasekhar realized is that this, this balance between gravitational pressure pushing in and the internal pressure pushing out that gives the star its structure. The internal pressure is a combination of the thermal pressure from all the heat that's generated and what's called electron degeneracy pressure, uh, which is an effect of quantum mechanics. So to understand this, let's take a look at a hydrogen atom. So we have a nucleus with one proton and an electron flying around it in this low-level atomic orbital uh, nearby the nucleus. If you want to make helium and you put two electrons around it, that's fine. You can put them into the same orbital because one is spin up and one is spin down. Electrons come in two different types, spin up and spin down. And uh, if you want to then go and add a third, you can't put it in the same orbital because of what's called the Pauli exclusion principle, which is a statement in quantum mechanics that you can't have two electrons in the same state in the same place at the same time. And so you can't cram a second up-type electron into this orbital along with these two guys because they don't have two ups. So for heavier nuclei, the electrons will then organize into the shell structure so that you never have to pack two electrons into the same state uh, at the same place at the same time. And so the same principle applies to stars. You have a whole bunch of electrons there. And so there is some limit to how much you can cram them together before they'll resist. And so gravity is trying to push this thing, and the electrons themselves refusing to be in the same, occupy the same space, will exert this so-called electron degeneracy pressure. Um, and that's what sort of holds up this core, which is cooling off uh, against the force of gravity. At some point, as you keep producing iron in the star, the mass of this thing just gets so big that gravity wins. The gravity will overwhelm the force of this electron degeneracy pressure, and then the electrons run for their lives. <laughs> Specifically, it triggers a process known as electron capture, which is when a proton will eat an electron, 
converting it into a neutron and then an electron type neutrino. So these neutrinos initially will just poof, scoot away from the star, carrying away more energy. So then you're continuing to lose pressure as you lose energy because the neutrinos are carting some of it off. So gravity wounds a little bit, compresses the star even more, heats it up. And in this very hot, dense environment, you produce very high energy photons, so energetic that they can just obliterate an iron nucleus and just smash it into a pile of alpha particles and neutrons through a process called photodissociation. This is a hugely endothermic reaction, meaning that it absorbs energy from its environment to make this happen. And so that continues to cool off the pressure, cool off this, this uh, core, reduce the pressure, gravity you know, gets, uh, gets the upper hand, and, and eventually just wins. So gravity will now crush this core down to the density of an atomic nucleus into a neutron star as all those uh, protons electron capture and then become neutrons. Uh, once it reaches nuclear densities, it can't crush it any further. And so all that matter that was falling in will hit this hard surface and bounce back, creating a very high density shock wave that is now propagating out through the rest of the star that's trying to collapse inward to fill that void. Um, and so that shock wave then moves outward and leads to this, this big explosion. So let's catch up with our neutrinos. So there, there's three different places where neutrinos get produced here. Uh, first, we have that so-called capture phase. That's when we have this electron capture with protons eating the electrons, producing electron-type neutrinos. So those ones initially will just go straight out. Next, we have the shock wave going outward which is extremely dense. It is so dense that even the neutrinos can't make it through. So this thing is stopping the neutrinos behind it. Meanwhile, floating behind that shock wave are a whole bunch of free protons and electrons. And so some of those protons will capture electrons, becoming neutrons, and producing more neutrinos, which are stuck in this region. But as that shock wave expands and the surface area grows, the density will go down. And so it eventually reaches some point where now the neutrinos can make it out and escape. And so once you reach that point, all these pent up electron type neutrinos will go flying. And so you produce a big burst of neutrinos. It's called a neutronization burst. And meanwhile, inside of this hot, dense proto neutron star, there's a number of mechanisms through which we can produce neutrino anti neutrino pairs. Much like in the hot, dense environment of the very early universe, we can produce particle anti particle pairs. So this is where the bulk of the neutrinos come from, this pair production. And so these processes will produce equal parts neutrinos and antineutrinos, and roughly equal parts of all the three types of neutrinos, the electron type, the muon type, and the tau type. So we have these six types of neutrinos, electron, muon, tau, and their antiparticles, all in roughly equal numbers being produced uh, in this hot, dense proto-neutron star. Can I ask a quick one? In the number two, mm -hmm. how does the shock wave slow down the neutrinos since they don't interact with anything? So the neutrinos, they, they do interact, but only very weakly. So it's just a, a, the matter is just so dense that uh, even the very weak interactions of neutrinos mean that the neutrinos are interacting in that shock wave. Are they repelling them or interacting? How does it slow the down? Right, so, so the neutrinos will undergo interactions like inverse beta decay and things. So, so they'll interact, they'll cause interactions inside that shock wave, adding energy to it. Hmm. A little fuzzy on that one, but okay. Yeah, so the neutrinos normally, if it's something like the density of Earth, no problem. They'll go straight through. It's just this is so much more dense that the neutrinos, um, there's so many things to hit. So until this reaches the, the density where they can escape, mm -hmm. it essentially completely stops the neutrinos from, just, from getting out. Uh, and then they come out as a big burst. I mean, Once tomorrow, we'll be dead. Oh, I'll, I'll say that on the, on the next slide. I'll talk about timing in just a minute. 
a couple of seconds. Just a couple of seconds. So the shockwave, the, the term suggests something that uh, increases and decreases and increases and decreases. Whereas the picture I'm getting is more like a single wall yeah, that catches up to other matter that might be the, um, so we talk about a sonic boom being one phase catches up to the normal speed and uh, paces it. So how, how is that term meant to apply? And is the, is the wave, oh, just the wave of the, the the, the matter that's left over, the protons, neutrons, and the electrons, is that what it's composed of? Right, so the question is about the, the shock wave and, and what it's composed of and in what sense it's a wave. Um, so, so it's better, it, it, your analogy with a sonic boom is, is right. So it's really, it's not some <coughs> oscillating thing, it's really just a wall of, uh, of density that propagates out. So that's um, made of basically ripped apart nuclei and as it moves through the matter, all these other shells will just rip things apart as it goes. Um, so it's really this, this one big wave front, this high density uh, wave that's propagating outward through the star. Okay, so, so this was all a sort of uh, description of, of some dynamics. And of course you can take this basic idea, write down detailed mathematical models, Detailed computer simulations, and so people uh, people do that. It's a very active field of research, and these models that people build make a definite prediction of what we expect to see in terms of the, of the neutrino, in terms of the, the time over which they're produ produced, the energy distribution that they'll have, and the overall number of neutrinos that are produced in a supernova. So this is just uh, an example of some time distributions for the different phases of a supernova, and I just draw your attention to here. So this whole time scale over which neutrinos are being produced is about 10 seconds. So the supernova will last much, much longer. Like some supernovas look bright for months. Um, but the production of this kind of electromagnetic radiation and, and things floating around, uh, the neutrino production, the actual core collapse, happens over a period of just a few seconds. So since we know about how many neutrinos would be produced in such an event, based on these models. We can use that to predict how often we would expect to see a burst of neutrinos from a supernova here on Earth, so that we can actually go out and look for these things. Like, with the sun, we had this, this idea of this nuclear fusion process, and so we could go out and look for it with a detector here on Earth. We like to do the same thing with these uh, supernova neutrinos. Uh, that number turns out to be about three per century. Uh, that we would expect to see within uh, supernovas within our galaxy, where we would actually see a burst of neutrinos we could detect. Um, so that takes some patience. Um, you know, don't hold your breath for that one. Um, but uh, as luck would have it, in 1987, a core collapse supernova, a Tech 2, goes off on February 23rd in the large Magellanic cloud, which is sort of down the block from the Milky Way, about 170,000 light years away. So this is an opportunity now to go and try to see a burst of supernova neutrinos on Earth. So it's 1987. What kind of neutrino detectors do we have? <laughs> well, there's three. So we have Kamiokande 2 in Japan, which we talked about last week in the context of solar neutrinos. <laughs> There's an experiment called IMB, the Irvine, Michigan, Brookhaven experiment, which is just over in Ohio. And there's an observatory in Russia called Baksan. So these are all experiments that are capable of detecting neutrinos that were up and running in 1987. And lo and behold, on February 23rd, 1987, the Kamiokande 2 experiment in Japan sees this. So this is the number of interactions detected as a function of time for just a few minutes that day. And here, for just a few seconds, you see this big burst of interactions that they detect. So, should this be it? So we'll now look at every single supernova neutrino event that we've ever detected. Which sounds exhausting, but it actually fits on a single page. 
These are the neutrinos detected from supernova 1987A. It's about a dozen events from Kamiokande 2, eight events in IMB, and five at Foxon. That's, that's what we got from this one. Um, but through this, we can measure the time distribution of when those arrived relative to the first one, and also their energy, and in some cases, their direction relative to the supernova. So what we can see is that this whole burst lasts about 10 seconds, which is consistent with the picture that we described. And hold on a second, we detected neutrinos. Like that model could have been completely wrong. Like it didn't need to be neutrinos produced in supernovas if we had it wrong. So, so just the fact that we see neutrinos at all is sort of a big thing. Uh, but we can go beyond that and look at the timing and the energy, which gives us some, some way to check the models. Now, this is 25 events. This is all we've got. And so these numbers, this table has received like an outside amount of scrutiny. Like people still argue about this, like that, that first one, hotly debated. Um, so this is, I think there's, I don't know how many papers have been written about the events of this table. We can ask now from, from Supernova 1987A what neutrinos can teach us about supernovas. So last week, solar neutrinos. We invented this model of the sun where we have these nuclear fusion reactions. They produce photons, which spend maybe 10,000 years bouncing around inside the sun before they finally emerge to come to Earth and be detected. And so you know, by the time they emerge, they've really been averaged out. They don't have the energy that they were produced with initially. They have some average energy that's characteristic of the temperature on the outside of the sun. The neutrinos, however, they come straight to us from the core of the sun, so they carry information about the energy of those reactions, and so we can use them to sort of look inside the sun and understand the dynamics happening inside, not just what's happening on the surface. And so with the supernova, we basically get to do the same kind of trick. The photons tell us a lot. We can measure the chemical composition of the supernova, for example on the outside surface, but they don't really tell us anything about the dynamics that are hidden behind that shockwave. And so by studying the neutrinos, we hope to learn something about how that dynamics proceeds. And so 1987A, with these 20 to 25 events, gives us a basic validation of the supernova dynamics model that we've described based on this measurement of the neutrino energy and timing. There's one, one figure to summarize that. The model prediction, this computer simulation and everything is shown in gray in the background, overlaid with the energy distribution from those 25 events from Kamiokande 2 and IMB. And so it, it's sort of the same-ish, which is about the best we could say with 25 neutrino interactions. So we can't really make detailed studies of the shape of the spectrum like we'd like to. But we can say supernovas produce neutrinos. The time distribution looks about right, order 10 seconds. So we think that dynamics of the collapse is right. And the distribution of energies is consistent with the theory. Um, so we think that that basic model that I walked through is really what's happening inside of the supernova based on that. We can ask a different question. So we're all interested in neutrinos of now what supernovae can teach us about neutrinos. So with supernova 1987a, there's a couple of interesting questions you can ask. Uh, the first is about how heavy neutrinos are. So we know that neutrinos have to be really light. I think I, I claimed previously that neutrinos were something like a million times lighter than the next lightest thing, which is the electron. Um, but we can actually make a measurement of what the mass of the neutrino is using what we see from 1987A. And the way that works is that if we have a, a good idea of what the intrinsic time distribution is over which they're produced, so say 10 seconds, we know all the neutrinos will be traveling very close to the speed of light. It's so very light. But the higher energy neutrinos will be traveling a little bit closer to the speed of light than the lower energy neutrinos that are produced. And so what we can look for 
is, uh, well, if they're all traveling the speed of light, you produce them over 10 seconds, they all go the speed of light, you detect them over 10 seconds. If some of them are going a little bit slower because the neutrinos are, have some, some mass, then it will tend to spread out that distribution. So by comparing the width of the time distribution that we see to the width of the time distribution that we expect, we can try to make some measurement of the neutrino mass. And so what we find from 1987A, by doing that analysis, is that the mass of the electron type neutrino is less than 30 electron volts, which is 0.006% of the electron's mass, which is really not that great of a limit. Um, we know for other reasons that the electron neutrino has to be much, much lighter than that. But I think it's still really cool to be able to ask that question by taking neutrinos produced thousands and thousands of light years away and timing them. That's, that's a neat trick to do. Another question we can ask is whether neutrinos decay. So in the standard model, there's nothing lighter than neutrinos, so they're, they're stable. They can't decay into anything. But we can put that to an experimental test as well. And simply by virtue of the fact that some neutrinos arrived from supernova 1987A, that gives us an idea of how long neutrinos must survive on average. And so the lifetime limit we can set for electron type neutrinos is about 150,000 years. Again, we have other reasons to believe that it's infinite or much, much longer than that. Um, uh, but this is still a neat trick to be able to do with, with neutrinos and supernovas. So maybe you know, not that compelling what we learn about neutrinos from supernova 1987A. <coughs> But if we think more broadly about supernovas, there's actually quite a bit more we can learn about neutrinos. We can ask questions about neutrino oscillations, which is how neutrinos change type between electron, muon, and tau type as they, as they propagate. So we touched on just briefly last week these matter-enhanced oscillations, the so-called MSW effect. And this is uh, an effect where neutrinos that are propagating through matter uh, that just the presence of that matter will, will change the way that they transform from one type to another. And so in the sun, we start out with all electron type neutrinos being produced in fusion reactions, and as they propagate through the sun, the effect of, of these interactions with matter is that we produce now uh, some electron type neutrinos, some of them turn into muon type neutrinos, and some of them turn into tau type neutrinos. And so by like measuring the different ratios see the different flavors, we can try to understand this matter effect and, and infer something about neutrino oscillations. Now the same sort of effect should be at play in a supernova. We have this very high density of matter, and so that should affect the propagation of the neutrinos. What's interesting about the supernovas, in particular in that hot dense proto-neutron star, we're producing electron, muon, and tau type neutrinos which will now go through matter effects. And so we start with something, and we end up with something else. And so again, by measuring the ratios between mu, tau, and electron type, we try to use those, uh, those measurements to infer something about neutrino oscillations, given our model of how the neutrinos are produced and how they interact with the material in the supernova. Another question we can ask, which is a very neat one, is about how neutrinos would interact with other neutrinos. So the neutrinos can interact so rarely, right, that if you make a beam of neutrinos and another beam of neutrinos, they're never going to get one to hit another one. Um, but the environment inside this core class is so dense that it is believed that neutrino interactions with other neutrinos will actually be an important effect. So you can have, this is kind of a standard matter effect that I described. You have electron neutrinos interacting with electrons. But you can also have neutrinos interacting with other neutrinos, uh, which will cause some sort of distortion to the spectrum of energies that we measure. And so we can make a prediction based on the standard model of particle physics how neutrinos should interact with other neutrinos, even though we can never do it here on Earth. Here's an environment where that happens. And so we can use our model of particle physics to predict what the effect should be on the energy distribution of those neutrinos, and then go out and look for it. We can make a detailed measurement of that. 
you know, we can make sure that our model of how neutrinos interact with each other is right. You know, just to illustrate that a little bit, um, here's just a figure showing uh, in the dash red is the initial energy distribution of electron type neutrinos, and in its uh, lower curves here is what it might look like um, our model of neutrino with neutrino interactions apply. So it could actually be a quite big effect. So it's something that we don't have the data to look for with Supernova 1987A. So we'll need to wait for the next one. So all these important questions that they could ask, and really learn something about neutrinos from supernovas, and certainly learn more about supernovas using neutrinos, really just need more data. More data means more experiments, and please, more supernovas. We've <laughs> been waiting a while. Models predict about three per century in our galaxy. 1987A was a while ago, so hey, maybe we're due for another. You know, it could be happening right now. Um, Sir, yeah. can't we use supernova explosions in other nearby galaxies? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so there's a limit to how far out we can. So I'll, I'll say it. I'll worry about that as well. Um, right, so to, to answer whether we're ready, um, I would like to say yes, we're ready. There's actually a, a supernova early warning system called SNOOS, which is a network of seven different neutrino detectors that are all looking for a burst of neutrinos. You'd like to see this burst in more than one detector at the same time to really believe that you've seen it and it wasn't just a fluke. Like with 1987A, Kamio Kande, IMD, and Boxon all saw it at the same time, and so that would give us a lot of confidence that it wasn't just some, some weird happening in one or the other. But so we have seven detectors all looking for neutrino bursts around the world, and this is all set up to send alerts now to the astronomical community. So if we see a big burst of neutrinos, we can let our astronomer friends know that a supernova is happening and they should go look. Get, get out your telescopes. So on the, on the SNOOS website, they say you know, no nearby core collapses have occurred since SNOOS started running, but we are ready for the next one. And in fact, they have a mailing list. So if you go to their website, you can sign up for their mailing list, and you can be there and be notified when a supernova happens. So actually, that's how I know it didn't happen, because I'm, I'm on the mailing list. Um, there's not a lot of spam. It's been very quiet for the last 30 years. So uh, I don't worry about that. What gets here first, the light or the neutrinos? <laughs> neutrinos get there first. Um, just, just by the timing of when they're when and how they're produced. So the uh, that initial burst uh, for the, the capture phase. Here's the first thing you see. Um, right, so this is, this is seven detectors. Um, in fact, there are a number more neutrino detectors that are all looking for supernovas. <laughs> We've got Quarxino, Super K, Snow Plus, Dune, Jinping, Nova. Basically, if you have a neutrino detector, you're looking for supernovas. Everyone uh, you know, is looking for this with good reason. Um, some detectors are capable of, of seeing the burst and, and participating in this early warning system. Other detectors will receive the early warning and then go back and look to see if they saw a burst. Um, but almost every neutrino detector is doubling as a supernova detector at this point. Uh, so to kind of illustrate that a little bit, I'll talk about how we do supernova neutrino detection in the Snow Plus experiment, which is one that I actually uh, work on myself and are involved with here in Chicago. So we talked about solar neutrinos. We talked about snow experiment, the Sudbury <laughs> Neutrino Observatory, which got famous for discovering this whole neutrino oscillation thing and solving the solar neutrino problem, this apparent deficit of neutrinos coming from the sun, which is explained by them changing type on their way to Earth. So here again is the, uh, the snow detector. This is nice and deep, 6,800 feet underground in a nickel mine in beautiful Sudbury, Ontario, Canada. The target volume there, where we're looking for interactions to happen, is 1,000 tons of heavy water this uh, water made of hydrogen that has an extra neutron in the nucleus. And this is all contained within this huge plastic ball. It's a 12 meter diameter 
acrylic sphere that we put the heavy water into. Outside that, there's 7,000 tons of normal type water, all filling this cavity, which provides some shielding from radioactive decays happening in the rocks that could send signals in that would fake a neutrino. And this whole thing is being watched all the time by about 10,000 photomultiplier tubes, which are these ultra-sensitive light detectors. I've been talking about photomultiplier tubes for like three weeks now, and so I thought I should uh, bring one in for show and tell. So, so they look like, kind of like a big light bulb. Uh, so, so these are devices that are capable of detecting a single photon, which they turn into a little electrical pulse that you see. So, Leave this here if you want to come up and take a closer look after. Um, so we've got 10,000 eyes uh, all looking inward into this, uh, this volume of heavy water. Up top, there's this little deck uh, where we have our electronics and instrumentation, which is a very dear to my heart. So that's something I was uh, So that's snow. Now, how do we turn this thing into snow plus? Couple of changes. We had to do some electronics and instrumentation upgrades. Most importantly, we took that heavy water. Um, I don't know if I, if I mentioned this before. The heavy water is it's hard to produce. It's extremely expensive, and so the snow experiment actually borrowed it from the Canadian government, uh, and then they had to give it back. So they don't have heavy water anymore. Um, so the drain the it out and then refill it with liquid scintillator, which is this material that makes a flash of light when a charged particle goes through it. That's what was used in the very first neutrino uh, detections. So we refill the thing with liquid scintillator. And uh, liquid scintillator is basically oil, and so we have a bunch of oil sitting in a tank of water, and uh, which would want to float. And so this gigantic uh, ball of oil would tend to want to go pop up through the deck, uh, which is no good, so we also had to install some ropes to hold it down. <laughs> so a couple of you know, minor, minor changes to the snow experiment. Um, Festo Plus, now a liquid scintillator detector. On the snow, the way we see neutrino interactions is we have a neutrino coming in, it maybe makes an electron. That electron makes the, the sonic boom in light. The Cherenkov radiation makes a cone of light, which we detect as a ray which is nice because you can measure the energy of the neutrino as well as the direction that it came from. In liquid scintillator, we don't see rings anymore. The light is produced isotropically, so it's just diffuse. Um, so we see a blob of light, but you can tell where the interaction happened inside the volume by, so it must have been close to this side because we saw more light over here. So you can tell the position, but you can no longer tell the direction. Now, supernovas. So the main course, the main way that we would detect supernova neutrinos in SNOW Plus, and this is true in other detectors as well, is through inverse beta decay. This is our tried and true neutrino interaction, where an electron antineutrino interacts with a proton in a nucleus. The proton turns into a neutron, and you have a positron, the electron's antiparticle. And so this was the reaction through which the neutrino was discovered in the first place. In 1956, Cowan and Rhinus set up their neutrino detector right next to a nuclear reactor that was producing electron antineutrinos. And they looked for flash flash. You see a flash of light from the positron and then a flash of light from the neutron that are produced here. <coughs> and so we have particle physics wise, this electron antineutrino coming in, it exchanges the W boson carrier of the weak nuclear force with a proton. And since this W boson has an electric charge, this is called a charged current interaction. So if we had a prototypical supernova about 10 kiloparsecs away, so kind of you know, near us in the, in, inside the galaxy, this is what we would expect to see in the detector. So we would have a bunch of neutrino events, about 200 interactions with this distribution of energy. And so already, just through this one reaction, you know, we would do way better than in the current world data set on uh, neutrino interactions from supernovas. 
There's another uh, interaction channel that would be really cool to see, but it's pretty hard to do. It's called proton elastic scattering. So in this channel, we have any old type of neutrino, which I'll call a new S, comes in and just gives a kick to a proton. <coughs> so this works for electron, muon, and tau type neutrinos. And just, uh, we'll, we'll just see uh, this charged particle going through our simulator, we'll create a flash of light. So we just see this proton. Particle physics wise, any kind of neutrino comes in, it exchanges the neutral Z boson with the proton, just giving it a little bit of energy, and this is called the neutral current interaction. And what we expect to see from this is a distribution of energies like that, where it's sharply peaked up to no energy at all. So all the interactions that we'll see will have very low energies, which is a problem because all the radioactive backgrounds in the detectors, all the alpha, beta, gamma decays that are going off all the time, we'll, we'll try to make the detector as pure as we can, but there's always a little bit of radioactive stuff left over. Um, and so those radioactive decays tend to be at, at low energies. And so we'll have, we'll be trying to look for this signal underneath a whole bunch of other things. And so depending on how clean we can make the detector in terms of radioisotope contamination, we'll have to just cut this off somewhere. There'll be some energy where we just can't look below it because there, there's too much background. So if we could set that threshold here, we would see a, a whole bunch of these uh, proton interactions. So you get to see everything under this black curve there. We don't do quite as well. We see a little bit less of it. And if things are, are really bad, you would just see this tiny little fraction there. So how well we can see this interaction just depends on how clean we can make our detector. So we're trying as hard as we can to make it as clean as possible. So here's the whole menu of all the different neutrino interactions we can look for in the SNOW+. Plus. There's this proton scattering here, there's this charge current inverse beta decay here, and there's various other interactions that, that can take place with different nuclei that we have inside our liquid scintillator. And I have a question mark here by this because it, it just depends on where we set that, that minimum threshold, how many we see. So the bottom line is that for a supernova about 10 kiloparsecs away, so within our galaxy, we would expect to see hundreds of interactions. And so that's just one experiment. This isn't even the biggest experiment that we have. So if you have all those experiments that I flashed up on the screen, you see thousands, really tens of thousands of neutrino events for something like Supernova 1987A. So we're, we're really ready to look in much more detail and start to answer some of these detailed questions about how neutrinos are interacting with the medium of the supernova. Uh, once we see the next one, and so you wait. <laughs> or do we? It turns out we don't really have to wait because of what's called the diffuse supernova neutrino background. So here we are on Earth, about a third of the way out in the Milky Way. 50 kiloparsecs away, that's where supernova 1987A was. We saw that just fine with neutrino detectors from 1987. About the limit of what we can see now as a burst of multiple detectors is around 100 kiloparsecs away, 325,000 light years. That's about as far out as we can look with our current neutrino detectors, given how sensitive they are and how big they are. But there are supernovas happening all the time out there in the universe, and we can really only look under, under a lamppost. We really can only see neutrinos from supernovas that are happening you know, on our street in the universe. And so what about all these ones? They're just producing, they're too far away. They still produce a lot of neutrinos, but just the odds of enough neutrinos to detect here on Earth reaching us as a burst is zero. So just not enough neutrinos for those guys. But if you look back to this picture of this proto-neutron star, so there it is in the middle with a shockwave going out. Recall, so we're producing the bulk of the neutrinos from a core collapse supernova inside this hot, dense proto-neutron star through these pair production interactions much like the pair production in the early universe. Now we think back to our model of the sun. 
Remember, we, in the execution reaction, we produce photons and neutrinos, and photons, because this matter is so dense that the photons will interact with it, uh, they, they bounce around a whole bunch, and they finally emerge, not with the energy they started with, but with some energy that depends on the temperature at the outside of the sun. And the neutrinos go straight up. The density of the sun is nothing compared to the density of a proto-neutron star, which is about the density of an atomic nucleus. So this thing is so dense that you produce neutrinos in these pair production interactions, and they will actually undergo interactions inside the proto-neutron star, bounce around, and like the photons in the sun, finally emerge on some outer surface with some averaged over energy that now depends on the temperature of the proto-neutron star. In the sun, the photons, they bounce around for 10,000 years, tens of thousands of years. The neutrinos in this neutron star bounce around for maybe a couple seconds. So that's largely what gives that the time scale. Does any event <clears throat> that causes gravitational waves like colliding neutron stars or colliding black holes produce excess neutrinos? Uh, yeah, it's, it's believed that an event like that could produce neutrinos. Um, <coughs> people, uh, particularly for the recent, sorry, that's a recent question. Um, the question was whether things like a merging neutron star or other gravitational wave producing events could produce neutrinos. Um, and so the, the belief is that events like that can produce neutrinos. Um, and so all these experiments uh, that are sensitive to supernovas, several, uh, several of them uh, went and looked at their data around the time of the, the recent gravitational wave observations to see if they saw a burst and no one had seen anything. No, no, no. Um, so, but those events are also really far away. So it may just be, be too faint to see. Um, so, um, right, so the, so the neutrinos are now emerging uh, with some average temperature spectrum that depends on the temperature of this uh, neutron star, with so some thermal energy spectrum, which we can calculate. And so we get a distribution of energies for these neutrinos that looks something like this. So it's actually around the same energy range as solar neutrinos or so, a little bit higher energy. So there's one more complication to account for. So you're probably familiar with the, the Doppler effect, which is the apparent shift in frequency of sound wave. Let's say a police car is going toward you and it sounds higher pitched, or going away from you and it sounds lower pitched. Uh, just based on the relative motion. There's a sort of analogous effect that happens in the universe with light. So we live in an expanding universe. So everything is moving away from everything else. And so everything we look at out in distant space is receding from us. And the further away you look, the faster away from us it's moving. And so this will tend to lower the frequency of the light that we see coming from these objects. So if you have a star that's nearby you, it will tend to have more like its true color, and a very distant star will tend to look redder as the, as the wavelength of the light is stretched out. This is called a redshift, and that's another way that we can measure distances on astronomical <coughs> scales. There's a similar sort of Doppler effect that will affect these neutrinos. So if you have a neutrino that's coming from a nearby source, it might have that distribution of energies that we just calculated. But a very distant source will be moving away from us very quickly. And so it will appear to us that the energy of that neutrino would be lower. So as you get more and more distant as a source, the distribution of neutrino energies tends to shift down, just based on the, on the relative motion of us compared to the galaxy where the neutrino is coming from. That's one thing we have to account for. Now, back to our picture of the universe and our place in it. So we have us in the Milky Way, 50 kiloparsecs, 100, 150, 200. All these supernovas happening that are too far away to see. What we can do is, as we look outward, further and further into the universe, take the number of supernovas that we see going off at each different radius, take that distribution of energies for the neutrinos that we expect to be coming out of it, properly shifted down to account for the distance, and build up some total spectrum 
for the energies of all the neutrinos if you add up all those distant past supernovas that were too faint to see on a one by one basis. So we have all these supernovas that are making huge numbers of neutrinos but are so far away that we can't see them. And so it's sort of take that huge number times that really small number and try to get to something that we can actually see. So you total them all up, you get some distribution of neutrino energies that we can try to go out and look for. If we can see this, this doesn't tell us anything about a particular supernova, because we've added them all together. So this tells us about the number of neutrinos and the energy of those neutrinos on average. So averaging, averaging across all those distant supernovas. And so this not only is something that we can try to do in the meantime, while we're waiting for the next big supernova to happen, but also helps to give some context to an event like supernova 1987A. So we don't know if 1987A was a typical supernova or a weird one, but if we can measure the average number of neutrinos and their average energy, then it sort of gives them context to interpret 1987A or the next one that we see. That's good, the problem is it's really hard to do. It's always the problem. Last week I showed this, uh, this figure, which is the solar neutrinos arriving on Earth for each of the different fusion reactions happening inside the sun. The number of neutrinos that we expect to arrive on Earth per unit area, per unit time. So how many neutrinos per centimeter squared per second. And the distributions of energies that they'll take. All the neutrino oscillation, solar neutrino stuff was largely done with these four on eight solar neutrinos. But as you move down the plot, we're talking about fainter and fainter sources. To the point where the lowest one, the so-called HEP, or HEP neutrinos, about a thousand times rarer than these, are so rare that we haven't seen them yet. So if we zoom in on that box, these are the HEP solar neutrinos that are so rare we haven't seen them yet. And three orders of magnitude below that is the diffuse supernova neutrino background. So it's, it's pretty tiny. Um, so it's really faint, but otherwise it looks like a lot like solar neutrinos. So I entered for the second time my PhD thesis, the other half of my title. Last week it was HEP solar neutrinos, and this week it's the diffuse supernova neutrino background. So since these look like solar neutrinos, just higher in energy, we can try to look for them in a solar neutrino detector like snow. So we already talked about the submarine neutrino observatory. Here's what our data looks like. I'll walk through this briefly. Uh, so the solid black line is the boron H solar neutrinos. Those are the ones that are easy to see. Red is the HEP solar neutrinos, so faint we can't see them. Way down here is this Q supernova neutrino background. And that's buried underneath this other background from atmospheric neutrinos, which are produced by cosmic rays. So at this point is where you would expect to see one event in our data set. So below here we don't expect to see anything, and we don't. So it's too small to see in snow, but we can actually rule out some funny business. This prediction is based on that whole model that I described of how many neutrinos should come out of a supernova. That could be wrong. We could be a hundred times as many neutrinos, and if it was a hundred times as many neutrinos, we would have seen something. And so by merit of the fact that we don't see anything, we can at least say the model is not wrong by a factor of, of 40 or so. If it had produced way too many neutrinos, we would have seen it. Um, so it's not quite a measurement, but we can at least constrain that the model is good to that level. So that's something. If you want a chance of seeing this uh, anytime soon, we have to go to a bigger detector, Super Kamio Kande in Japan. So they're looking for this uh, through inverse beta decay, our, our tried and true reaction there. And uh, in this figure, I have a couple of different models of how these neutrinos are produced. And there is the limit that Super Kamio Kande set, which is a skirting the very top of that. So they are extremely close, within a factor of two, of being able to discover this. And uh, so in the very near future, they're going to take their detector and add gadolinium to it. And by adding gadolinium, they'll improve their ability to detect neutrons 
so they can see the flash flash more efficiently. And with that, they're, they're quite confident that they'll be able to detect this diffuse supernova neutrino background, like I heard, within three years. Um, so they actually drain the detector out and refill it with the gadolinium water starting in June, which would actually make this a really bad time to have a big supernova for this to turn it off. But that aside, let's uh, wrap up a little bit about supernova neutrinos. So the supernovas are these hugely powerful events that we think are very important to explaining the universe as we see it. As with the sun, we can learn a lot about neutrinos by looking at supernovas, and we can learn a lot about supernovas by looking at the neutrinos that come from them. But we don't have to wait around while we're, we're waiting a third of a century uh, for the next big uh, supernova to go off. We can look for this diffuse supernova neutrino background and learn about the average behavior, which is both interesting and gives some context to the single event observations. Uh, one funny note to include on, um, if you're familiar with the web comic XKCD, uh, they have this nice column called What If, where they answer some, some funny science questions. And, uh, and so one of the questions they answer at this length is how close you would have to be to a supernova to actually like, get harmed by neutrinos that never, that rarely interact. Um, and they, the answer is so that you don't have to worry about it. Um, is that you actually have to be inside the star. So <laughs> you have other problems. Um, but I still think it's, it's pretty neat that, that despite how early they interact, you know, it's possible. So, so actually, it's all worked out um, at that URL. So if you're curious, um, go take a look at that. Um, so next week, again, we have a talk on neutrino cosmology with Marco Rivera. So cosmology is the study of the, the origin, evolution, and the fate of the universe. And so they'll be addressing questions about uh, you know, what we can learn about that from neutrinos and vice versa. Uh, so I think that should be really interesting. And uh, with that, I thank you.
So is there a, uh, every star in every galaxy is producing its own solar neutrinos. So is there a diffused solar neutrino background like a CMB in addition to this one we talked about, the supernovas? Yeah, so, so the question is whether there's a diffuse solar neutrino background in addition to the diffuse supernova neutrino background. Um, and so, so there is, um, but it would just be much, much, much fainter uh, just by the number of neutrinos being produced. So we'll do this one first. They'd be all different directions, right? Yeah, yeah. So in both cases, um, the question about the, the directions that they're coming from. Um, so in both cases, um, that, that they would be uh, isotropically coming at us from, from all directions. They just look out, adding up over the, the whole visible universe. There was an article in the science magazine that there was a supernova that produced the most, another galaxy, produced the most neutrinos ever detected and said it was 10 to the 59th power. Yeah. But they never gave what per second, per minute, they never gave the unit. So I presume it's second, I guess. I uh, yeah, so the number of neutrinos that are, that are produced in, in a supernova, so it'll vary a little bit, but the, the order of magnitude is, is 10 to 58 and power uh, neutrinos being produced. Um, so basically, the entire, the, the the gravitational potential energy of, of the initial stars is much larger than of the final proton star, and all of that difference, 90 whatever percent of it, turns into neutrinos. So it's this huge, huge number of neutrinos, so, which will vary a little bit from one supernova to another, um, and that that would be the total number of neutrinos produced over the whole thing. So 10 seconds or, or whatever it is. Oh, okay. 10 seconds. Yeah. Oh. Last week you had mentioned something about the index of refraction of mm -hmm. the neutrinos change in speed. Um, we're not getting any interaction between dark matter and dark energy at all, or do you think there's some interaction uh, with the neutrino that we just can't detect that level? Hmm. Uh, so the question is about whether there are would be um, matter tech effects with dark energy or dark matter. So I think dark energy is such a, a mystery. We don't really know what that is at all. It seems to be some energy density shutting the universe apart. Um, so the dark matter, um, so there, there will be some distribution of dark matter around the galaxy where this is coming from. Right. Um, we don't really know what the dark matter is at this point um, or how it interacts. So a lot of experimental searches now are assuming that the dark matter will participate in weak interactions. So they would be able to interact with neutrinos. The only thing that we know it does is interact with gravity. We know that it, it seems to have mass. Um, so if the neutrino, if, if dark matter really does have weak interactions and it could interact with uh, neutrinos, uh, the density of it would be so low that it would be a small effect. Okay, so we couldn't really use that to map out the density of the dark matter. Probably. Yeah, I think that yeah, probably is uh, not enough. Yeah. Uh, it's been postulated in the very early universe that uh, there were gigantic stars that were formed. Uh, certainly, the production of neutrinos from them uh, would be uh, enormous. Uh, do the transgender neutrinos get tired and settle down into one type, or do they keep changing, and can we detect them now? Uh, so, so the production of this is about the production of neutrinos in very early large stars, and how we might detect those now. So those would be a part of this uh, diffuse solar diffuse solar neutrino background. Um, they would tend to have their energy shifted very low by the same kind of Doppler effect that I described, um, to make them doubly difficult to detect. Um, 
So and another point that you, you brought up was about the flavor changing of nutrients. And, and so over a very long time, so we're, the oscillation model that I described has these, these three waves, new one, new two, and new three all propagating, propagating together. Uh, over very long times and, and long distance scales, those will spread out to the point where they're no longer coherently adding up, breaking that oscillation pattern, and so you'll have a bunch of new ones, new twos, and new threes. That still interact like an electron, new one, or tau type neutrino, so you can't tell which one you have, uh, but they'll be incoherent. Um, they won't have a coherent way after some large amount of time. Is there any way to tell that after, you know, like for instance the one produced by the Big Bang, they produced all kinds, all three kinds of them, would they eventually all turn into electron neutrinos? Or would they or would they eventually statistically become 33% tau, 33% gluon, 33% electrons? Uh, yeah, so the question is about what you end up with today in terms of the flavor composition of neutrinos uh, from the, the Big Bang. And so this effect that I was just describing about the, the decoherence um, will come into play. So you end up with some fraction of, of new ones and twos and new threes in the mass states. And so you'll detect those then as uh, electron muon or tau neutrinos. And so there'll be some can they calculate, predict what percentage of those three? Yeah, I think that's that's calculable. I don't, I don't know the the result of that calculation, but maybe okay. uh, next week, Marco could tell us that I have a conceptual question about something you talked about last week. Um, I, I get this idea that uh, having a neutrino that has poorly defined or well-defined mass. So you said that the, uh, the ordinary solar neutrinos, um, the theory is that they have a poorly defined mass, so it's a poorly defined de Broglie wavelength, and so that complicates things, as opposed to the component uh, interfering new one, two, and three that have a well-defined mass. And so my question is about this concept of well-defined or ill-defined mass. Remembering an admonition once in our book by a Nobel laureate that uh, mass has a single definition and it's the resistance to acceleration and nothing else. Um, I'm trying to understand what would, Ill, what would be ill-defined about these ordinary neutrinos um, I mean, does ill-defined mean it doesn't have it, or it's so hard for us to find or, or figure out what it is that we just don't know what it is, or is it something else? What do you mean by ill-defined and well-defined in that term? Yeah, the question was, uh, what, what I mean by uh, a well-defined mass for the new one, two, and three, and an ill-defined mass for the electron new one and tau type. Um, yeah, so maybe I, I wasn't uh, I was speaking loosely last week. Or does, um, so, does it define mean that it changes? Yeah, so, so the, the electron neutrino, if you have an electron neutrino, um, is some composition, some well-defined mixture of the new one which has a definite mass, the new two that has a definite mass, and the new three that has a definite mass. So in that sense, the electron type neutrino has a definite mass. Defined by that combination. Um, so where, where it gets messy is just having, you know, as things propagate, you now have some different mixture of these, these masses, and so you can have a different mass later on as things oscillate. I'm trying to understand what you just said. Is that the equivalent of saying that the mass changes as this mixture changes? Right. Yeah, which is which is okay because you the total energy is the combination of mass and energy.
Okay. Um, quarter past, so maybe uh, we should get other questions and you can come up and you can discuss more. Otherwise, 